Good morning. Good morning. Y'all ready to worship this morning? So I feel like this is what the Lord is saying this morning. Um, so I just got back from a wonderful Colorado vacation. You guys know that I left out of here last week. Woo! It was so nice. And so when I got there, there's so much to do in Colorado. And so I wanted to honor the Lord in all things and, and even in our vacation time. So I asked the Lord, I said, what do you want me to do this week? And you know what he said? He said, rest. Who said that? He said, rest. And I was like, but Lord, there's all these trails. And last year we hiked really hard. And, and there's all these things I wanted, wanted to do. And I wanted to fish pretty hard. And, and I did do some of those things. But he said, the main thing I want you to do is rest. And so he began to speak to me. And he gave me a word this week. And I'll be sharing it throughout the next few weeks. But the word he gave me was reset. He said reset. And I know we've been in a season. We've been in a time. We're in the, the days of teshuva, of of forgiveness and returning to the Lord. But he really showed me this in a bigger picture because, you know, as you all have followed my journey, you've, you've seen over the last few years, I was in a big season of transition. And in transition, you end one season and you move into the next. And I'm looking at a lot of you all that have had some transitions in your lives. Maybe it's in a job. Maybe it's in a, a business you've started. Maybe it's in relationship. Uh, maybe, maybe it's in your ministry. But we've been in a lot of transitions. But he says, as we're going into this next season, we just really need a time to reset. And he gave me a word for each of, of the letters in reset. And the first word he gave me, the R, was rest. And the second word he gave me was examine. So he wants us to examine our lives and to look and see where are the areas that we need to change? What are the areas we need to shift and to allow Holy Spirit to do that work in our lives? And then the S, he said, stop. Stop. Stop doing some of the destructive things in our lives that are keeping us from doing what the Lord called us to do. And, you know, I know Selena's going to talk about this. We're in 5784, and that's all about the door. Sometimes moving through a door to a new season means closing a door to the past. And so that's what that stop means. And then the next word he told me, I love this word. He said, explore. He said, I want you to explore your destiny. I want you to explore why I created you, what, what things I have for you to do in this next season. So that's kind of the fun thing of just going into the spirit realm and hearing what the Lord says. And then the very last thing he said with the T in reset is train. And he gave me two specific things. He said, I want you to train to finish the race well. So that means a lot of things. That means spiritually, but it also means physically. It also means going into a season where we pay attention to the temple of the Holy Spirit that God has given us, that we pay attention to our health, that we enter into rest and to good nutrition and to exercise. And then he also says we're training to rule and reign. And that's a lot what we're going to do in this season, this feast season. We're training to rule and reign with our bridegroom, Jesus Christ. So this morning, as we enter into a worship time, we're just going to have a short worship before the teaching, and then we'll enter into worship again at the end. But I just want us to take this time to fully enter into rest. And, you know, the Lord said that rest doesn't mean absence of work, but it means trusting in his provision, in his purpose, in his plan. It means resting in those things instead of striving. So let's just enter into his rest this morning. Would you stand with us, please? Every breath we give to Yahweh. Oh, every breath we give to Yahweh. Every breath we give to Yahweh. Whoa. Every breath we give to Yahweh. Oh. And every word we give to Yahweh. Oh. Every word we give to Yahweh. Whoa. Every word we give to Yahweh. You've been to me 
was another in the waters rolling back the seas should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me there is another in second E stands for everything. And when you remove the everything, you get rest. Wow. 
And then in the very back corner, you see this Hawaiian. <laughs> <laughs> this is Elizabeth Makaoka. And Elizabeth and I have been friends for 40 years. We actually met briefly at a conference at ORU, and it just extended to a 40-year friendship from different things. Uh, I'm wearing my Hawaiian outfit today in order uh, to honor Elizabeth. This is actually the dress I bought. Gary just loves it when I tell these stories. 25 years ago, this is the dress I bought in Hilo, Hawaii, which is Liz's city. And like he says, I can get more out of a fabric than anybody else. Like, forget the fashion thing. I don't really care about the fashion thing. Okay. This one I wore forever because it's so comfortable. It's pretty. It's so easy to teach in and change children in. And I, it was good. It was good. Okay. So we want to welcome Liz and honor her. Um, she has just, you know, brought new eyes. You know how when you take your children someplace and you've seen it before but they have not seen it? And you get to see it through their eyes? That's how it's been with Liz this last week. She's, she's experienced hillbilly. <laughs> and she said to me, could you define hillbilly? And I go, no, not really. But. <laughs> so she's seen bits and pieces. I told her there are different levels of hillbilly. Okay. So, but when I call myself a hillbilly, she goes, okay, tell me again what this thing is. <laughs> so I've loved watching Oklahoma through Liz's eyes. Because, you know, sometimes it's good to see fresh and anew, correct? <laughs> this is the season, as Lori was saying to you, of teshuva. Yes, a Friday night started our new year. So we should be having New Year celebration and New Year parties and New Year's everything. Saying, praise God, this is a new year. We can set the last one behind us. Right. We're glad it's done. <laughs> and we're ready to do something new. And this season, these 10 days are a time to do, as Lori said, reset. The word teshuva means to return to God. So it's the word that just says, stop what you're doing, look what's going well for you, and look what's not going well for you, and just turn away from the things that are holding you back, that are holding you there. So these 10 days, that's what it is. It's a soul-searching thing, and to do that. Now, I don't know how God speaks to you all the time, but a lot of times with me, if he can't get my attention by speaking to me, he finds other creative ways. Mm -hmm. Like he speaks to me through people or situations. <laughs> and in my case, it's usually in my physical body. Okay, Because I ignore my physical body, in case you all didn't notice that. So he will make something not quite right to get my attention. Do you hear? Now I'm not saying he does that with you. But for example, God has been wrestling with me over some different things that he wants to, us to go into and to do higher and higher. And I re was wrestling back going, mm, I don't know if we're ready for that yet. And you know, you remember when Jacob wrestled with that mm -hmm. angel? And so for the last two weeks, my whole left leg has decided it's not going to be nice. And I'm like, Gary, rub this leg. And he goes, I think it'd be better if you just repent. <laughs> causing your issues. You get my point? <laughs> the big vibrator machine's about worn out. Okay. <laughs> I'm telling you this because God will probably speak to you in a different way. He will put a thought. He'll put a billboard. Okay. He'll put somebody to say something. It'll be something you see on a TV or something like that. These are the 10 days he's definitely trying to get your attention and say these are the things you need to prepare for and align for, for what is coming, for what is there. So this morning, um, Arista, as you all know, who usually teaches our Hebraic first fruits and our months things, is doing a terrible thing. She's in Ephesus and Patmos and Italy. Wow. And I think we've all told her to bring home rocks. <laughs> so there may not be any rocks left by the time she brings... We're not telling customs she's bringing rocks. 
<laughs> we're just going to get in. But we, I, I can only imagine what her stories are going to be about when she's sharing with us where she has been and what she's done. So since she is gone, I just informed Miss Selena <laughs> that, you know, she could teach this. She's got this. <laughs> and so today, I've asked Selena to come and bring our first fruits message Amen. and our story about the new year and where we are. Beautiful. Because we love you. Yes. <laughs> That's why. Okay. That's what you heard, right? Yeah, right? <laughs> it's coming. It'll, it'll do what it's told. Yeah. I'm glad I don't mind being in front of people. <laughs> And there, we made it. First obstacle of 5784. <laughs> if only that were true. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so here's we're gonna do two things. Oh, yeah. Hey, it's my husband. I gotta do it. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, now we're good to go. Two things we need to do. One, take a deep breath and let it out. That was more for me than you. Number two is for all of us. Take your right hand, put it by your right shoulder, and cross it over to your opposite hip. Buckle up. <laughs> okay, there is a lot. There is a lot today. And as I was putting this together, I'm like, Lord, there is a lot. <laughs> he goes, yes, there is a lot. And that's where he left it, so I guess that's okay. So, Tishri, this is... Okay, first of all, I want to pray. Father, you are good. You can be nothing else but good. And I thank you for that. And I thank you for your goodness and your kindness and what you are going to reveal to us today. And I call forward each and every person's spirit to receive this. And that next in line would be mind, will, and emotions to line up with that. And then our bodies follow. But Father, I just thank you for, I thank you that you are a lot. I thank you that there is too much of you for us to grasp. I thank you that you are larger and bigger than anything we could think or imagine. And I say and I declare that we get to rest in that, Father, as we hear what you have for us. May it be a seed, a seed that goes into us that will not stop growing continually throughout this year. That this is not the all and the everything that you have to show us, but it's the beginning. It's the beginning of the year. It's the beginning of what you want to harvest within your people. And we thank you for that. We ask that your words are the words that stick with us, and anything else that is not of you will fall to the ground, null and void. We thank you for your love, your kindness, and your beauty. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I do invite you, as you hear this, there is a lot. And that is a beautiful thing. I've learned that. But what I ask of you is that you would hear this, and in the hearing of it, you would receive it into your spirit before you go to understanding. If you try to take all of what you're going to see and hear today and put it in its nice, neat little folders and in your brain and get it all lined up, it's not going to work. Okay? Because through receiving comes understanding, not vice versa. If you try to understand first, you will not receive. 
okay? So I call your spirits to hear this. Tishri. Tishri is all about Rosh Kadesh, which is simply the first of the month. We'll talk about that. Feast of Tabernacles in here and head of the year. So this is, is just a very ripe, ripe time that is full of so many things, okay? So Rosh Kadesh, strange Hebrew words, right? Really pretty easy. It means head of the month. So we celebrate Rosh Kadesh 12 to 13 times a year, right? It's just the first of the month. That's as simple as that word is. What these times are all about are they are called moeds. They're set apart times, okay? And the way I think about a moed, so we all have calendars, right? There are things we do through our day and our months and our years that we just do. We don't bother to put them on our calendar, right? We do dishes. I don't have dishes listed that day unless I haven't done them in two weeks and then I have to <laughs> list it. But there are things, we go to Walmart, we did all this that aren't on our calendar. But the things we know we absolutely have to do, what do we do? We put it on our calendar. These moeds are times that God has put on his calendar to meet with us. And so I would say it's pretty important that we put them on our calendar because he's going to wait there. He's going to wait in that moed, that appointed time for his bride to come and meet with him, whether we show up or not. And that just makes my heart want to show up even more. So that's simply what a moed is. It's a time on his calendar that he has said, I want to meet with my bride. Okay. So this is a cycle of blessing. When we meet month after month after month and we stay in God's timing, we have a cycle of blessing. It brings us into revival and deliverance. This reminds me, <coughs> excuse me, of, to me, it's like gas in a car, right? We typically, we have, Kevin and I have set up, you know, when it gets to a quarter of a tank, let's go ahead and fill up. Half maybe, yeah, half would be better. I'm doing good to hit quarter. But, you know, that way you never are left on the side of the road. Yeah. Too often I have been left on the side of the road because I'm like, yeah, it's at a quarter of a tank, but I can go to an eighth. I, can, I still have like 40 miles if I hit eighth, right? We start calculating. I can do this. I can, and then <laughs> it must be a thing of the house. <laughs> it is? Okay. Um, so anyway, then you find yourself too often on the side of the road, stuck. And this is the same way. If we choose to not step into first fruits, if we choose to not operate in this cycle of blessing, we will find ourselves stuck on the side of the road or just in a completely different place. So I invite you, you got, you're here, right? You're here, so you're participating in this. And you get to receive this continual reshifting to the right timing. Okay, we're in the seventh month of the redemptive calendar. We're going to talk about all of that in a moment. This month does hold the fall feast, which we're going to kind of breeze through a little bit, but I encourage you um, to listen to last Sunday because Yolanda did a phenomenal job about kind of expanding on the feasts and each part of the feast and how they all tie together. So I really encourage you um, to go and listen and watch that. And then because it is a seven, we know that it is a month of completion and fullness. Okay, so that's just kind of an overarching view of Tishri. Now, as Arista has kind of set for us, we kind of look at certain elements of each month, and so I'm just going to show those to you. Um, we're going to look at the history and the events of this month. We're going to talk about the fall feast, since that's where we are. We're going to kind of tie that into the tribe of Ephraim. Our alphabet is going to be 5784, which seems a little strange to be numbers, but we know in Hebrew all numbers are tied to letters of the alphabet, and so we're going to take a... a Probably quite a detailed look at that. That's where we may spend most of our time. Oh, sorry. And then the constellation is Libra, and the color is black onyx or agate, agate, however you want to say that. And it's beautiful. So it's either black or every color in the world. Okay? So you're kind of all in between there. And it's beautiful. It's just beautiful. Um, the agate reminds me of every possibility. We are standing at the beginning of the year, and there's every possibility of color, every possibility of what God wants to bring to us. All right, history, events, and timing. So here's the biggie, the two calendars. This took me a while. <laughs> because from birth, our 
first day of the year is the first month of the year. And so to separate those out and let those be two fully functioning calendars at the same time kind of blew my mind a little bit. So I'm going to just kind of show you a way that my brain processed this. So Rosh Hashanah, another Rosh, so we know it means first, right, or head. Rosh Hashanah is head of the year, start of the year, and that's the time and season that we are in with Tishri. Why is the head of the year in the seventh month? Isn't that a great question? Okay. One, we know sevens are dear to the Lord, so it should not be surprising to us that the starting of the year is in a seven, but um, we'll get to that too. So we have two calendars we're going to look at, the cycle of blessing and the cycle of redemption. Okay. Cycle of blessing. The cycle of blessing is what was originally started. When God started everything off and he started, started us in a, a time frame that we're used to, a structure, it was his original calendar, okay? The months counted from here. It's considered creation's anniversary, all right? So in Tishri, with Tishri comes the celebration of creation, the start of it all, when he spoke and the world was. That's what... Tishri holds, one of the things that it holds, and that is the, the cycle of blessing that he gave to us. However, it's very difficult to walk in blessing if you're walking in sin. They do not coincide. So when man sinned and all the sin entered the earth, we got shifted off of the cycle of blessing. Um, I like sci-fi too, so I think of it kind of as a quantum phase. Just out, just a little bit. And so you're always trying to reach that blessing, but since you're out of sync, it just never works. It, we can't couldn't enter in, but God. God brought the first Passover lamb and changed us into a cycle of redemption. Here's the reset. Here's the reset. God did not desire us to stay out of the cycle of blessing. God is not a God of, you screwed up. Guess you get to stay there. No. He already had it and already planned out of how he was going to bring us back into phase, back into alignment and sync with him, and he did it through a second cycle. And we're going to take a look at that. Okay. Now, this is how my brain works. So I just thought I would lay this out for you in case some of you needed this or it would help to explain it to a person in your life who has a brain like me. Now, this is a presumption. Cycle of blessing. We started with Tishri, right, where... Creation began, everything started, it was all beautiful, cycle of blessing, these were the months in their order. Now there is a presumption here that this is the order they were in. I'm just going with what we have, just kind of, they're all in, the same, all in the same. Now, there came a dividing point called sin. And as is the whole story of the human race, God was bringing us back to himself. So he instigated a cycle of redemption, which began at Passover, which is so beautiful to me. I went back, and I went into Exodus 12, too, and a little bit before that to kind of see where we were. I always had the picture. Okay, I've been through the years six times, this cycle, six, seven times. I always had the impression when Arissa taught this that they came out of Egypt, got to Sinai, and he said, now this will be your new first month, Nisan. No! <laughs> Like, I actually went and read it for myself, <laughs> like you guys need to do. It was while they were in Egypt. While they were in Egypt, right before he gave them the instructions to go find a lamb, bring it into your house, you know, let it be there, and then slaughter it, and then put the blood on the doorpost, and then the angel will come over. We know that part. Before he gave them those instructions, he said, this month is to be for you the first month now. And that was Nissan. What's remarkable to me, we know redemption came from the Lamb. We know redemption came from Jesus Christ, the Passover Lamb being slaughtered for us. We know that this Passover in Egypt was the foreshadowing of that. But do you know what God did even before that? He reset our timing. He shifted our timing. How important is it that we are in the timing of God? It's everything. 
because he took the time to reset our time before any of that got started. That should tell you, and sit with it. I don't have the fullness of that, but sit with him with that. There's an importance. Do we have to follow this? I don't believe so because we're under grace. But is there an importance here that he's trying to show us? I absolutely believe so. And I'm looking forward to learning more and more. But that, that point just, that point came to me. If he took the time to reset the time, then we should pay attention. Because what is the enemy always trying to do to us? Sabotage the time, shift us in times and seasons. So there is a big key that we need to learn more about. Okay, so he said, this is now your first month. So it was no longer Tishri. It was Nisan, right? But remember, this is how my brain really, really allowed me to go here. Tishri holds the creation, yes? Yes. That's when creation started, head of the year. It's linked with Tishri. But what did God say? This is now, Nisan is now your first month. So let's, let's kind of keep an eye on Nisan there too. Look, it was a seven. Okay. Now, as Nisan shifts up, because we need to shift it into month one, right? It rolls everything else. So head of the year, that creation anniversary still linked with Tishri, and as we move Nisan up to month one, where does Tishri land? Month seven. It's still the anniversary of creation. It's still head of the year. But that's how they got into two cycles. Because now we count the months with Nisan, but unlike our calendar, the months are not tied to the year. The beginning of the year is tied to the anniversary of creation, which remains in Tishri. Okay, so that's kind of how my brain did it. And, and so I hope if that's been one of those things that you're like, yeah, I just, I trust what they say. <laughs> sure, whatever. <laughs> sure, you know what you're talking about. This is how my brain had to reconcile it. So I hope that helps. Um, hope that helps. So let's, let's kind of focus in on that cycle of redemption. Why did he do that? Well, like I said, I believe he was resetting the time, a true reset, before redemption even started. So I believe that is part of redemption, is the correct timing. Okay? As is stated here, kind of talked about that. He initiated a new cycle to bring us into sync. So when we're in sync with that, things go a lot better. And this cycle of redemption leads us into the timing of the annual feast, since it is linked with that creation, but it was changed at Passover, then it's linked in there together. So the cycle of redemption starts with redemption at Passover, moves us on to provision at Pentecost, and into the fall feasts of harvest starting this month. Okay? So just a brief look. Like I said, the fall feast, I really encourage you to go back and listen to last Sunday. I loved the breakdown and this, the insight into that. But the fall feasts do create a pathway for us into God's glory. It's a road map. How kind of him to give us a road map. He never wants to leave us in the dark. So if you want to go and read this for yourself, and I encourage you to do so, because obviously you can learn things when you do that. Leviticus 23 is where you're going to find kind of the instructions for these fall feasts. Okay? It's a four-step countdown into God's glory. We have the Feast of Trumpets, which was last, this past Friday. In the evening, it is a wake-up call, and we're going to talk, break this down just a little bit. Um, we have the Days of Awe, as um, Yolanda mentioned, we are in at the moment. This is a time of seeking him and um, coming before him, turning and returning. The Day of Atonement, which we know from the Old Testament, when the high priest went in and covered the sins of the entire nation for the year, which means a little bit different for us on this side of the covenant. It is a day to be restored if you want to know, so you can keep in timing. The Day of Atonement is Sunday, sundown, Sunday, September 24th. The Feast of Tabernacles comes after that, um, and we are going to have a gathering here at D.C. at sundown, Friday, September 29th. We say 6 o'clock. 
I don't know when sundown actually is. But 6 o'clock, we're going to gather here. Be checking your email because this week there's going to be an email going out so that you can sign up to bring um, one to RSVP, which helps us knowing the amount of food, but two, you can sign up to help bring some of the food and all of that. So be watching your emails for that. If I don't have your email address, come see me so I can make sure to include you in that. Okay. Just real quick recap. Feast of Trumpets is when the shofar is blown. Okay, it's an awakening blast. It's, hey, wake up. It's the start of the year. Wake up. Get back on timing. It's God's alarm clock. Um, we heard the shofar. We know it sets us on the right path, so revival will come. Redemption will come. Um, and it's time to turn and return. After Feast of Trumpets, we go straight into the Ten Days of Awe, which ends in the Day of Atonement. I love this. The Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send out his angels with the mighty blast of a trumpet, and they will gather his chosen ones. You have to remember, these fall feasts are the feasts that have not yet come to pass, which I find exciting. You know, I always look back, and everything in the Old Testament, they're like, he's coming, he's coming. There's this great anticipatory expectation. That's what we can have in these feasts. As we celebrate this, we know we are in the foreshadowing. We are a part of the foreshadowing, and we get to participate. And if you want to go quantum, our participating in it ties us to it. So when we participate on September 29th, we are participating in the final. We are pulling it to us. We can experience it now. That is so, we get that so often, is he wants it for us now. We've been told to wait. Why? He wants us to link to it, and in linking to it, it pulls it to us. So we get to celebrate in that anticipatory expectation, which is called hope. All right? So I love, I love that this, is a type and a foreshadowing. Okay, so we said the Feast of Trumpets, which is as simple as hearing the shofar, but letting him do with that sound what he wishes, it leads us into the 10 days of awe. And sometimes I call it the 10 days of owl. <laughs> because you sit with the Lord, okay? The 10 days of awe is about sitting with the Lord and coming to him and saying, what is in me that you desire for me to put on the altar? And now we've been in, a lot of times invited to write a list as we sit with him to list those things out on paper because this 10 days of all ends in the day of atonement which we give it all back to him, take it away, burn it up, whatever, Lord. I also invite you to do this. If on Monday he reveals something to you, don't wait till the day of atonement. Give it to him. We don't live under the law, we live under grace. So this morning, he brought something to my attention as I sat on the porch. And we dealt with it right then. And you better believe that when I come to the Day of Atonement, I am going to be so thankful. See, you can still participate in the Day of Atonement, even if you don't have a bunch of things to put on the altar. Because you know what? You have a bunch of things you don't know that you need to put on the altar. So you might as well put those on. Known and unknown, right? I've taken care of the ones you've shown me. Those are the known. I put everything unknown up there. And I celebrate in humility because you burn it all up. And you paid the price and it's covered. So that, that time of atonement is not lessened if you deal with stuff during the 10 days of awe. And again, our temptation is to go, let me evaluate my life okay, I've done this wrong and this wrong and this wrong and this wrong. And you make this whole list and you may never touch the thing that he truly wants to get rid of for you this year. Because it's not about religion. It is about relationship. It is all about relationship. These things came out of almost a religious aspect, but it's the only way they had to relate to him. We have a much deeper way to relate to him, and we get to sit with him and say, what do you want to burn out of me? What do you need to get out of me so I can be the person you designed me to be? Because that's what we should desire, and that's what we should want. 
but we have to sit with him to find the key. I believe some of the things that he will show you in these 10 days of awe are keys to the pieces of your destiny that he wants to give you in 5784. Because what he chooses to focus on is the thing that's in the way of what he will choose to use you for in 5784. So that, that's the days of awe. Which does lead into the Day of Atonement. Okay, sundown, September 24th. Jewish phrase is Yom Kippur. This is the day we know the high priest went into the Holy of Holies the one day a year. He poured out the blood of the Lamb and covered the sins for the entire nation. We know that has been done for us in Jesus Christ. So we come to this day in humble adoration, gratefulness, and thankfulness and for all that he's done for us. And then we put everything, like I said, known and unknown before him so that he can take it and do, cover it, get rid of it, do with it as he wishes. Um, this is the only day that we are asked to fast. It is the only day God requires of us to fast. And so, from sundown on September 24th to sundown September 25th, we fast and we pray and we, are, we just sit with him. It's, it's just such a sweet time to be with him. I used to not believe that with fast. So I was like, this is not a sweet time. <laughs> this is a time that I'm hungry. And I don't like that you're making me not eat. That's where I came from. <laughs> He's done a lot of work in me. I'll just say that. To now, it's just a beautiful that when you're so focused on him, it just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Isaiah 44, 22. I have wiped out your transgressions like a thick cloud and your sins like a heavy mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. I will redeem you. I have redeemed you. Signed, sealed, and finished. So that's what you stand in on the Day of Atonement. And then the Feast of Tabernacles, which actually, you know, is when we get to build a sukkah. So a little place outside. Um, in the Jewish culture, they will spend all seven to eight days outside in that sukkah to remember how he took care of them in the wilderness. Um, and we can remember that, too. He is our provision. But it's also much, much deeper and greater in that he, tabernacle means to abide like those moeds, this is a moed, he longs to abide with us and he will meet us there when we enter in with expectation. Again, I love this. This is kind of new actually for me as of yesterday, okay? <laughs> this anticipatory expectation. So Feast of Tabernacles mirrors the marriage supper of the Lamb. So I wanted to read this to you. Revelation 19, 6 through 9. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. This is for us. This is for us. And we can truly tie into this when we celebrate Feast of Tabernacles with the Lord. It is a joyful celebration. A joyful celebration. And so I, I ask you to write this on your heart as we go into this season. This is what we're tapping into. It's real. It's there. And we can already be a part of it. All right. Feast done. Okay. This, this is actually very much what's burning in my heart this morning. Um, I don't have the fullness. I'm going to give that disclaimer. I'm going to speak to you that which he has spoken to me. And I do pray that the Holy Spirit will place it in you as a seed. Because he has something to reveal to you. It's not all going to come through me. Here's the celebration. <laughs> you hear it? I love it when you're so in sync. Okay, so it's a seed. Take what this is. It's the beginning. Let it grow. All right, 57, 84. We know in the Hebrew language, numbers and letters, same, really. You just have to see what they correlate with. So 
5700 is basically just in the year of. Okay. We know we are in the decade of the 80s, which is a pay. Okay. I think I circled it for you. Yeah, down there. Pay. 84, the number 4 is Dalit. So just so you know, these are the two words that are really combining to shape this year. And you want to go another level, then you include Tishriol in that and the new flavor that it gives that. So let's take a look at this. 5784. Like I said, 5700 in the year of, pay is the decade of. We've learned and been continually reminded pay is about being face to face. The panim with God, the breathing in and breathing out. Remember how at the beginning we synced our breath? It's a panim. Face to face. Breathing in and out as one. Okay? We also know it's the word for mouth, so things spoken are super important in this decade. You partner that now with four, which is dalit, which is a word for door. It has an aspect of humility and rest. I mean, could we just stop right here and you can go? <laughs> I mean, that's phenomenal right there. But we are going to dig into it because he did, he gave me a little bit more. So let's look at Dalit as door. Okay. So these are the symbols that go with the Jewish letter Dalit and the number four. So we're looking right here at this symbol as a door. And what they see, and they're like, that doesn't look like a door. Think about a tent door. Okay, you see it? The tent doors are open. And that actually ties in with humility. We'll get there. All right. As I was thinking about door, and I'm like, Lord, where do I start? I mean, we know doors. We've gone prophetic with doors for all the time. We like doors. You know, we do all the door thing. But there had to be a new focus, a honed-in focus for 5784. And when I started looking into that, this verse, I'm going to call this the verse of the year because it hit my spirit so hard. Revelation 3.8, I know, this is Jesus, I know all that you've done. Now I have set before you a wide open door that none can shut. For I know that you possess only a little power, which means we don't have the power to shut it if he's opened it. Yet you've kept my word and haven't denied my name. And I want to partner that with Isaiah 22, 22. I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. This should bring us great encouragement. He has things in place for us that nothing, ourselves or hell, can shut. Can we miss them? Yes. And that's why we need to be cautious of our timing. And we really need to just focus in on that timing of the Lord. Also, here's what I want you to think about. This is where the Lord really went with me. So the word door, when you look at it in that Revelation 3.8, it really means an opening. So I think the big thing about all years, but especially has been brought to my attention this year, is all of these words, door, humility, rest, you have to let God define them. We will get off if we use our own definitions. Okay? And so when you look at this word, door, with Dalit, it's an opening. That could look like anything. That could be an opening to a new piece of your destiny. That could be an opening to a job. That could be an opening to an understanding, right? We've got to let, it's just, it's an opportunity. That could look like suffering. And if you're not willing to step into an open door of suffering, then you may not be stepping through the right door. So let him define your doors. In my mind, I just see it as he's opening a space and an opportunity for us to go through. That's the door you're, you're kind of keeping your eye on. So we cannot shut the door that he opens, and we can't open a door he shuts. But there's a different element here, because we are made in his image, so we don't have the power to change what he's put in place, but we can create 
especially we've learned we can create through our words. We can create blessings, we can create curses with our words. Mm -hmm. I think where he wants to go. There's like 10 different directions we can go from here. All right, so in the, in the decade of pay, all right, we know we can create. And our words, in this 10 years, our words are especially powerful. So when we speak out of something, we can actually create our own doors. Does that make sense? We have the power, because we are created in his image, to make our own doors. And even if they're good doors, if they're not his doors, then we could possibly get shifted off the path. Does that make sense? Okay. I want you to look at this. One of the first places we see a door, Genesis 4, 6 through 7. Then the Lord said to Cain, we know the story of Cain and Abel, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Cain created a door. We know thoughts are as powerful as words. You think he was thinking beautiful, lovely things about Abel? No. So what did he create? A door. He created an opportunity to sin. He created an opportunity to kill his brother, and we know he did. So the problem, the thing we need to look out for this year is, yes, God is going to open doors for us, and he's going to shut other doors for us. But if we are not careful with our words and what we speak, being in a line with him, we are going to create so many doors we won't be able to find his door. And I am taking that as a warning. That's how my spirit took that, is be careful. Master the tongue. Master your thoughts. You have to be able to do this with him, or else you are going to find yourself, honestly, in a completely different dimension that he didn't even intend you to be in. And that's when danger happens. So be careful of creating your own doors, but God. Because then my mind was, well, inevitably, I'm going to create doors. <laughs> I know my tongue. I know my thoughts. So, Lord, there's got to be a fail-safe here. What, what can we do? And what he said is, and I saw a picture of all these doors, and I knew his was one of them, just didn't know which one, is he told me humility. What will get rid of doors that I have accidentally or deceptively created? Humility. Going to him and saying, Yes, I did that. I thought that. I said that. And now I know these doors are open. How can I get rid of them, Lord? Redemption. Remember that cycle of redemption? To remember that I have no power in and of myself, but only by the Holy Spirit. And when I submit to that and I humble myself to that, then he will get rid of those other doors. And we see that. This is where Dalit as humility comes in. If you look at that letter that I've circled, it's seen as a bent over man before the Lord. And I add to this a beautiful layer of how, how many of you, I'm probably like one of the shortest in here, right? How many of you can just walk into a tent door? What do you have to do? You have to bow yourself to get through the door. So humility is uh, its just key. It's key to the door of 5784. Humility. So then I, you know, went to definitions again with the Lord. What is humility? You know, what can I get away with? What do I really have to do? What is humility? What does that look like? I, you know, because I will tell you, the church has a false definition of humility. Humility is not debasing yourself. Humility is not looking at yourself and speaking every bad thing about yourself, and therefore you are humble. I strike that. I cancel that. I nullify that. I feel God's fire on that. That is pride. That is not humility. 
In humility, God should be able to give you a one-story house or a mansion. And whichever one he wants, you go, yes, Lord. Sometimes it takes so much more humility to receive the big things of God than the little things. Because we're like, oh, no, Lord. I don't need a mansion. But what if he says, I want you to have a mansion. I need you to have a mansion. We have to humble ourselves and say, okay. I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get why I need a, a more powerful computer than what I had planned on. But he knew why I needed it. He knows why you need those things, be it small or be it big. Humility has nothing to do with circumstances and everything to do with who Jesus Christ is and our alignment in that. So Proverbs 22, 4, because I thought, well, I can think things all day in my head, but I need to know what the word says. Humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor and life. Some, the humble one gets the riches and the honor and life. It's just, it's, it's, it's this backwards thinking of the Lord that I love. It's backwards to our ways. But we often get off on this whole fear of the Lord thing. So I went to a different translation as well, the, the Passion Translation. Laying your life down in tender surrender before the Lord will bring life, prosperity, and honor as your reward. Tender surrender surrender. That's humility. That is no matter what he asks of you, whether it is in your scope of understanding or not, being submitted into tender surrender and saying, yes, Lord, I am yours. I am here. <laughs> I liked this. So this was another aspect he brought to me of humility. Fine versus tender surrender. Because he asks us to do things. Have you ever been like this, or is it just me? Selena, I need you to do them. Fine. <laughs> I offer that that's not humility, okay? <laughs> I'm like, well, then, Lord, what is that? Because I'm still doing what you asked me to do and just kind of teenagery about it. And he said, fine, fine, is obedience. It's being obedient, not necessarily humility, Okay. What I offer to you is that they, they, they come together no matter what. They're in a pair, okay, obedience, humility. But let me offer to you, when we do the fine obedience, often when we're done, we get humbled. Would you agree? We're like, oh, that's why you needed me to do that. All right, been there? Okay. Yeah. So when we just stark obedience, we will be humbled. Can I offer to you? that the better version is to do humility first and then step into obedience because I think things go a lot better that way, okay? So just a little thing he kind of threw in there. might just be for me. I don't know. Just saying. Obedience is good, but humility will be required to be able to walk through God's openings this year. Amen. Will be required. So obedience will get us a certain place. Humility will get us to God's place. Okay? So really focusing on that one. I get to bring the warm fuzzies today. <laughs> okay. As is always, Jesus shows us the patterns, right? That's what we see from Jesus' lives, patterns that we can walk into. So this is the pattern. This is it. Write this one down. Study this one. Get into it. See what he has to say to you. Philippians 2, 6 through 9. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He what? He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. There's your humility and there's your honor. Did Jesus say, fine, I'll go to the cross? <laughs> fine, they screwed up, I'll do it. No, 
That wasn't the pattern. Right? It's a different pattern altogether. Maybe one we might have created a little bit outside of him. But this is, this is amazing. Life itself humbled itself to death. The highest form of humility, the highest example of humility, the very essence of who he was, he put aside to tender surrender to Father God because of his love for us. And therefore, he received the highest honor and the highest place. And that is there for us. Because he is life, we are life. Because he humbled himself to death, we can die to ourselves every day. And our highest honor is seated at the right hand of God. And we actually literally get to step into that. That's not just a nice ethereal picture. That's a real tangible thing. So, moving then on to Dalit as rest. Okay? And here's this one. If you're musical, if you know sheet music, you'll know immediately what this looks like. When you read sheet music, this is a rest. And it's right there in Dalit. Yes, Gary, that is a rest. <laughs> well, we'll go. Okay. You see what you want, Gary, and we'll see the, the real thing. <laughs> Okay, so this is a rest. And what I actually love about this in music is this is a whole rest. This is the entire thing. It's not a quarter rest. It's not a bit of rest. It is a whole rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. rest. Now, this does not transliterate to nap, okay? We're not talking naps, I know, right? You can have them, but it's not this. Because that's not all he wants to give you. He wants to give you so much more. Okay, let's take a look at this in the Passion Translation. Are you weary? Carrying a heavy burden? Come to me. I will refresh your life, for I am your oasis. And what he told me is, again, this is wrapped up in humility because the church doesn't like to rest because we have to be about God's business. Which is against God's word. But we find it humble because we are always serving and we are always serving someone else and we are always doing the things. But we are to rest. We are to rest in completeness and wholeness. You see, this is coming into Tishri which is a month of completeness and wholeness. It's a whole rest. And what, and Lori alluded to it at the beginning, and what I was told as well, kind of cool the prophets are in the same thing, right? This is so much bigger than what we consider rest. You have got to be able to get as much rest figuratively in your nice sweet space at home as on the battlefield. You got to be able to sleep on the horse in the middle of battle. You got to be able to sleep in the foxhole in the middle of battle as soundly as the oasis good spaces. No fine, I'll sleep. Okay, we've already been through that. But to truly rest in those places, A, you have to be humble, B, you have to be in the right doorway, right place. And C, you have to trust. You have to trust that he cares for you enough that he will watch over you. So if you are having trouble resting, check those places. Check that you're in the right place. Check that you are in the humility that he asked you to be in. And check to see if you trust him. And if any of those are not there, ask him. Ask him to give them to you. And then just be prepared for him to get you there. Okay. So that's the big part of this year, 5784. I'm not going to say that's the big part. That's the beginning. <laughs> All of that, that's the beginning. 
And he longs, he longs to show more and more to you. Because how 5784 plays out in your life is not going to look the same as how 5784 plays out in my life. But they need to play out together to bring the unity and the wholeness of 5784. So for the month of Tishri, which is all tied up into this 5784 anyway, right? It's not separate, even though it's, it's all together. So this is an, another layer. 5784 happens in Tishri. All of this happens in a month of completeness and fullness. And next year, it will end and wrap up in a month of completeness and fullness. But Tishri is also a big part of it. And in Tishri, we take a look at the tribe of Ephraim. Ephraim, who is on the west side. It's that first purple one. We're starting there. These are the young ones. Do you get that? He starts each year with the young ones. The next generation. It's just so appropriate and so full. So let's take a look at Ephraim. We are moving into that west side. Okay. Talked about that. Yeah. These are the young ones. Joseph, so this is one of the things I had to get used to. So all of these are tied to a tribe. I'm like, where's Joseph? Joseph got left out. No, Joseph got a double portion. So instead of Joseph, oh, okay, Lord. Joseph's focus was on the legacy. Joseph's focus was not on, what are you going to give me, Lord? What's my inheritance, Lord? Why aren't you doing things in my life right now? What was he doing? He was positioning his sons. He was positioning his sons into their place. He was creating their inheritance and showing them how to be who they are. We as Christians are too short-sighted. The enemy is far longer-sighted than we are. He doesn't care if he has to wait 10 generations to get something in place. He'll wait. We get upset because we have to wait for a Walmart order for 40 more minutes. We get upset and we stomp and we cry because God hasn't fixed the thing we asked him to fix by tomorrow. Abraham never saw his promise in the physical. He sent it down the line. He made sure things were in place. He did the work for the future. He did the work so that that promise could come to light in whatever generation the Lord chose. And he didn't have a problem with it. We are too short-sighted. And that is something we need to fix in ourselves. We need to ask the Lord to do the things, to, to show us the things and wait upon the Lord. And if it takes it coming to life in our next generation, we say, yes, God. Yes, God. Humility. Tender surrender to his plan, not ours. So in this, we see that Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph ends up his lineage with a double portion. That's a big part of Tishri is that doubling. Okay? It's a month to be fruitful. And he was the youngest. I think this is key. We need to be watching the youngers. Okay, a little bit about Ephraim. His name means double. This month is one to be fruitful and multiply. This is what the Lord told me. I thought this was interesting. I'm looking forward to digging deeper with him. He was showing me that when you double something, it creates a new thing. Okay? These are the two he gave me, and I'm hoping he'll share more with me, but I heard him say, when you double humility, you get honor. When you double rest, you get restoration. I think there's more doubles to come. So go home, seek, seek what the doubles are. Seek what he's showing you because I believe we as the body need to know what these are. But these are two you can focus on. Doubled humility is honor. When we double our rest, it's restoration. Important leaders that came from the tribe of Ephraim, Joshua, Samuel, Jeroboam. So I love that you can see 5784 in these, right? Joshua humbled himself to learn from Moses. He spent a long time under Moses' tutelage. 
so that he could become the leader he was supposed to be. Humility in Joshua led to his ability to be in obedience to go into the promised land. Samuel, pure in heart. Pure in heart leads to humility and a true voice in the decade of pay. Samuel had a true, pure voice that rang out. Jeroboam, this is the other side of things. Okay, instead of humility, we see pride. Jeroboam led Israel into idolatry, even to a saying as bad as Jeroboam. So many kings were labeled as was Jeroboam. It was not a nice label. Okay, it was, it was bad. So just a warning there. Ephraim showed up at all the markers. Okay, so this is something that we've done for the last several years. There were some very specific circumstances in the Old Testament, David becoming crowned king in Hebron, um, Hezekiah restoring the Passover, and Josiah restoring the temple. These are things that when we look at which tribes were there, we can see who surrendered to the Lord, who came back into that humility and like, yep, we've been off, let's get back. Okay, so Ephraim was there. So we can see the characteristics inside of this month are to be loyal and true and humble and pure. So we can tap into that. That's open to us this month. Psalm 16, Psalm 108 calls Ephraim the helmet of his head. Well, the helmet protects the head. What's in our head? Thoughts, what comes out of our mouth? Words, which create doors in 5784. Okay, so Ephraim, just having that character, being that, that head space, watching what you're thinking because thoughts inevitably lead to words. So that's all a part of Tishri, is just giving that over to the Lord. Okay. And Zechariah 10, 7 describes him as a mighty man who rejoices in the Lord. If you're willing to rejoice in the Lord, then you're probably doing pretty good. Okay? All right. So then we look at the constellation of Libra, which is the only constellation that is not a character or an animal, a person or an animal. It is a thing. Okay? Still in the noun category, but it's a thing which draws your attention to it. That's what I think is really neat. So the only one that is an object draws your attention whoop, to the head of the year. But it also draws your attention to redemption because it's the scales. Libra is the scales. It points to the Day of Atonement, the judging. How's the balance going to be weighed? And we know that Jesus made it right for us. Okay. which can bring then also a focus to the extra attention and prayer for our justice system. All right. And remember, the stars are not defined by their picture, right? We've all kind of got off on that, like, what? I always thought Leo looked like a hanger. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, where are we getting this? It's the name of the stars, if you remember. So each of the bright stars and the lesser stars have a name, which means, in this case, balance is what it means. And Jesus brought us back into balance, that redemption cycle. All right. How about another deep breath, shall we? Inhale. Whew, exhale. I told you there was a lot. You were right. I was, wasn't I? I like it when I'm right. <laughs> Maybe that's not humility. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So the summary... Here's our summary, 5784. It's a year of doors, a year to seek humility, and to rest in him. And these are good things. These are beautiful things. And I think when we partner them together, it is going to be amazing what he does. Tishri is a month to be fruitful and multiply, so we're going to be looking for those doubles. I really want you to come and tell me, like, really, when you hear a double and what it creates, I want to know because I want to keep a list of the doubles that he's bringing forth in 5784. Um, Feast of Tabernacles, we want to be on alert. We want to repent and return then to tabernacle and abide with our Lord in an awesome celebration. That is Tishri, 5784, all the things that I know 
And so I'm going to want to know all the things he shows you because he desires to reveal his mysteries, not just to the people who speak at the front, but to everybody who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the picture that I created long, well, several years back for Tishri, and I call it the sound of promise. So I just want to read this over you and let you receive this. At the beginning of each new who break, mm, let me try that again. <laughs> At the beginning of each new Hebraic year, Rosh Hashanah, the shofar is sounded. Rosh Hashanah is believed to be and remembered as the beginning of creation when God spoke all things into existence. That sound of God, the sound represented in the shofar, the sound that comes from our mouths, bursts forth from us with power. That power can bring either blessing or cursing, life or death. We choose blessing and life. We choose to release and receive the sound of promise. The electric shock waves represent the sound of God bursting forth from himself, the shofar, the shofar or each one of us in our words. The rainbow colors represent the sound of God releasing the fullness of his covenant and the fullness of his covenant promises. The star field in the background represents the spirit realm where we are seated in his promises. Genesis 1-3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Leviticus 23, speak to the sons of Israel, saying, in the seventh month, on the first of the month, you shall have a rest, a reminder by blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. Amen and amen. Yeah, we're going to have Candy come and lead us in communion. Mm -hmm. I think we should all just take a moment just to uh, be grateful. Um, just think about what Jesus done while they're passing the communion. Let's just take this moment to really thank him and be grateful for this. Mm -hmm. What a privilege it is to come and share this with each other and with him. We just thank you, Father, for this time together. Thank you for what you provide for us through the blood and the body of Christ. We just want to be grateful now for all that you do. We want to receive all that the blood has obtained for, for us in the body that you shared for us. Your covenant has provided. The truth is, Jesus said, Moses didn't give you the bread of heaven. It's my Father who offers bread that comes as a dramatic sign from heaven. The bread of God is the one who came out of heaven to give us life to feed the, the world. So right now we just take the bread and we lift it to you, Father. We thank you that, we, that it's blessed. And we receive all that it means for us, that the healing, the provision, and all of it. We just receive it with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name. He did the same with the cup of wine after supper and said, This cup seals the new covenant with my blood. Drink it, and whenever you drink this, do it to remember me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're retelling the story, proclaiming our Lord's death until he comes. So let's lift this cup. Lord, we just thank you for your blood that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And we step into that covenant, we just praise you and thank you. And we remember what it does for us. In Jesus' name, amen.
So I love the songs that the Lord gave us this morning. The first song we're going to sing is called Communion. And if you really listen to the words in this song, it's taking us back to the garden. It's resetting us. It's, it's shifting us back to God's original design and, and of his creation of us. In the next song, and I think we'll just flow through these, so we're not necessarily going to stop and explain them. But the next song we're going to sing is about, it's called Exalted. And it's about blowing the shofar of our hearts. And we know that the shofar resets and realigns us. So we're going to do that today with our voice. And then lastly, we're going to go into a, a song called Burning with the Wise. These last two Caitlin wrote, so I think that's awesome. And Burning with the Wise is all about where we should be as a bride of Christ, waiting and watching and preparing for the return of our bridegroom. Would you stand and worship with us? Take me back to the garden Lead me back to the moment I heard your voice Bring me back to communion Lead me back to the moment I saw your face And it was all so simple It was easy to love With no space between us, it was easy to trust. You are closer, closer than my skin. You are in the air I'm breathing. Yeah. It 
feels so good to know you are my friend. It feels so good to know you are my friend.
said to bring the next generation up to dance. So we invite all the littles, and even if you're in between littles, come up and dance this morning. You guys want to blow your shofars? Yeah, you want to come blow your shofars? We give you permission to be as loud as you want blowing your shofars.
not quite ready to end yet. We're going to go a little over, but that's okay today, right? So as we go into this next song, we've alerted our spirits. We're awakened, and now we're going to look to the skies for our coming Lord. So dancers, everybody, don't leave. We're going to go on on this one, too. All right, in this song, there's a line that says, Wake up my soul, can you hear the midnight shout? Yeah. And if all the little shofar blowers want to blow with that part, that would be awesome. So.
Holy Spirit will remind you and remind you and remind you. But in case you forget, guess what? You can go and watch it again. Yes. Refresh your memory. Get it into your deepest part of you. And I know we didn't get to do your thing. Do you have your thing you want to do? Are you good? Okay. okay, you're good. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to have Kevin and Selena come. Kevin, I want you to pray over us and to bring that Father's blessing into this place where we're going to be. And then we'll finish with the sound of the shofar, and then we'll yell, yay, God. Right. Bring it on, bring it on. Mason, you want to come up and stand with him? You going to blow it or you going to blow it? Let's pray. <laughs> Father, I, I just want to thank you for your Father's heart. hard to even fathom the love that you have for us. The love is so great that Jesus dying on the cross wasn't a choice that you made because if it was a choice you could have chose the other. But your love was so great that there was no choice. That was what was going to be done. We thank you for that. I just want to send a blessing over this congregation today that they would know in this month, this beginning of the year, how great is the Father's love for them, for each one of them. We thank you for that love, Father. We thank you that there is a redemption. There is a cycle of redemption because you want constantly to draw us back to you. We thank you that you desire that more than we can even imagine. We love you. We thank you for this day, for the chance to gather as your family as your loved ones together. And so you are here with us. We thank you for that. We love you. And say in Jesus' name, amen. 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 So everybody release. That's shofar. <laughs>